Well hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Joanne. I am a law student from Australia. Um, look, there was a case that piqued my interest the other day. Um, it was the anniversary of a cold case and this case got back. Hello Bo. This case got back into the, um, the media uh, because it's been... 44, 45 years since uh, this crime occurred and nobody knows what's happened. So we want to look at a couple of different things. I was trying to put it together and condense it into one and my plan was to do voiceovers and then I realised that um, I'm more suited for live streams. So on um, – so – this was what the police uh, did. So it was 1978. So that's 44, 45 years? Well, 44 years. Sorry, 44 years. 1978. So the police uh, on the anniversary, on the 17th, I think it's the 17th of February, uh, was the anniversary uh, of this crime. And so this is what the police has put out, and then we're going to look at the um, the what what the media put out on that day, and then uh, True Crime Weekly also did a very in depth investigation. So let's have a look here. So this is her. Um, when I update the thumbnail, her picture will appear. But this is Marianne Fagan, and. So in the description, you'll see that there is a number for Crime Stoppers and a website. Anybody that's watching this out of interest, if you know anything that's happened or you, you can help some way to uh, solve this crime, then I think uh, we would be very uh, – I think the family would be very grateful because uh, the children were very young, as we're about to find out. So it says, Homicide Squad detectives are continuing to appeal for information in relation to the 1978 death of Armadale woman Mary Ann Fagan. Mary Ann lived with her husband and five children who were then 15, 13, 12, 6 and 17 months old at a house on Dandenong Road. So this happened in Melbourne uh, where I live. On the morning of Friday the 17th of February 1978, the 40 41-year-old woman was at home getting her children ready for school. Her husband was working away and was not expected home until later that afternoon. About 8.30am, Mary Ann drove her children to school in the family car, a Holden station wagon, and returned home alone about 9 15 Shortly after, she was seen by a neighbour speaking to council workmen who were repairing the road outside the Fagan family's home. Mary Ann had her car parked in the driveway and she was last seen about 10.30 that morning in the front yard of the property by a witness who had driven past the house. At 11am, Mary Ann's husband called and had a brief phone conversation with his wife and that was the last known contact. Shortly after 4pm, the Fagan children came home from school and noticed the side gate was open. Unable to locate their mother, however, they could hear the baby crying in the house. Mary Ann's car was still in the driveway and the doors to the house were locked. The children made a call to their father from a local phone box and went home and broke a window in order to get inside the house. Sadly, they found their mother deceased in the front bedroom. Um, Mary Ann had been bound and gagged and fat, fatally stabbed a number of times. Despite a significant investigation over the past 45 years, motive for murder have never been established and a number of personal items taken from the house have never been recovered. Detectives believe it is possible there are still people in the community who know what happened to Mary Ann and who is responsible. Despite the passage of over four decades, Mary Ann is still much loved by her family, in particular who ch her children who remain hopeful of getting answers about what happened to their mother. Now, that was the police uh, statement on the, uh, that came out on the 17th of February 2022. On the same day, 
Um, so this was the Herald Sun, also on the 17th of February. So this is um, also on the 17th of, uh, of February. So the end of the 45th anniversary. This was the, the Herald Sun, um, the local rag. Uh, Mark Butler is a crime reporter. So this is what they've said. So this is, so th that's the page. 18th of February 1978, murder of five slain daughter finds, daughters find body. So that was the newspaper article um, from the original time. So it starts off by saying that, you know, family hoping they'll get some answers. It's 45 years since Marianne Fagan was murdered and the children have spoken publicly for the first time of their desire to know what had happened. No one has ever worked out why the killer stabbed Miss Fagan 14 times in her Dandenong home on February the 17th, sometime between 11 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. She had early returned home from a school run in the family's Holden station wagon and was later seen by a witness speaking to council workers in the street. Two of her children found her naked body bound and gagged on her bed and they were forced to break in when they returned to a locked house about 4.10pm that afternoon. The phone had been disconnected and their baby sibling was crying in another room. Mrs Fagan's husband, the late RAAF serviceman group captain Collins Fagan, was left to raise the children Anthony, Catherine, Rebecca, Collins and Patrick alone. Catherine, who was 13 at the time, said this week what followed was decades of silence among the siblings about the catastrophic event. So this is her before and then this was her on her wedding day. She was beautiful, wasn't she? We never spoke about it ever, Catherine told the Herald Sun. That ended last year when they cleaned out the North Cordfield family home where their father continued to live until his death in 2010. In the attic, they found where he had lovingly stored their mother's belongings in boxes, unable to part with them. Catherine said there were personal items, thank you notes, diaries and clothes from her days in the swinging London of the 1960s. It was an experience that made their mum seem real, especially for Collins and Patrick, who were so young at the time. There was mum's whole life. It led us to talk about it. It was difficult for us, but bittersweet and lovely. He, Dad, was so devastated he couldn't deal with discarding her possessions, Catherine said. Catherine said Collins did a remarkable job with the help of Mary Ann's mother and supportive schools to send five well-adjusted people into the world after what had happened. He really had to be head down, bum up, and say, I've got these kids through, Catherine said. I probably thought about it every day for years, and I think we were very lucky to have support mechanisms and Dad's strength. Their mother, though lost early, was a big factor in that, Catherine said. We, got, we all got through all right. We had a great start. Mum was authentic and honest, she said. So this is um, Group Captain Collins Fagan. So that's obviously before he, before, um, he, he's, he passed. Collins Fagan had spoken to his wife by phone at 11am the day and his devastation was raw in the aftermath of the tragedy. There was no reason on earth why she should deserve such a brutal end. The agony is, con was, is constantly with me, he said. I've searched my mind thoroughly and I can't think of anyone who could carry out such a heinous crime against my wife. There is just no reason. A coroner's inquest revealed a Melbourne City Council had been repairing the road near, nearby the day Mrs Fagan was murdered. The inquest heard some of the workers who spoke to Mrs Fagan on the morning. She was killed, had given unsatisfactory evidence. One witness had been far from honest with information he gave to the police, but the hearing did not offer answers to the cold case. 
son Anthony recalled his mother as a fun, generous and loving woman with a beautiful smile. We were very close and for her to be taken um, from the family was incredibly painful. Dad did an amazing job to raise us under the most difficult circumstances with the mantra to carry on as she would have wanted. There have been untold sadness at every milestone family event. Daughter Rebecca said she was loving, caring and always there for the children. I remember her smile and laughter, Rebecca said. Mum has missed her five children growing up, birthdays, family occasions, weddings, grandchildren, building a beautiful, long relationship with Dad. Detective Senior Constable Steve Kelly of the Homicide Squad said the family deserved answers. We still don't know why Marianne was murdered. However, we continue to hope that we will get the information that leads to detectives finding who is responsible. Senior Constable Kelly said, It is never too late to tell us what you know and any piece of information, no matter how insignificant you might consider it to be, could be what the investigation investigators need. Reports at the time said police believed it was almost certain the killer was an airman but did not discount other possibilities, including that he may have worn the uniform to lull Mrs Fagan into opening the door at the time. One witness who cited the man was taken to all Victorian RAAF bases to inspect a parade of servicemen. Air Force supply stores were checked in case the killer had recently bought their uniform. Detectives who worked on the case said the man would have been very strong because of the nature and the number of wounds. Well, it's interesting because True Crime Weekly uh, did an investigation and seems to think that there's a link between another uh, cold case um, and so it, it, it's all very interesting. Um, so this was this was done in April. So this um, article, this is what we're going to look at, is an investigation done by True, True Crime Weekly. It goes into a little bit more detail and... It does talk about a lot of the, um, it, it goes through all the newspaper articles uh, and goes into a little bit of detail and it's also got her um, gravestone and, and some other stuff. Yeah, well, I'm wondering whether the new tech um, could shed some light. So this is from True Crime Weekly. Um, so all of these are going to be linked below because, um, you know, you've got to credit the sources. And, I've, you know, as I said, I've also got the other information um, regarding how to report it. You listed them in your thinking priority. Look, I've got, I have got lots of, I've actually got a few questions myself um, which come out of reading. When I read this one, I came up with a list of questions. And so you will see um, as I have the questions, I will speak them out loud um, because there is one particularly about how one of the children returned home from school, what happened to one of the children. So, um, but as I said, so this was, um, so by all accounts, Marion Fagan was living a quiet middle class life at 575 Danny Long Road, Armadale, before evil arrived on her doorstep. So Davis. Sarah Davidson's a reporter here and then at the recent high profile coronial inquest into the unsolved 1980 murders of Maria James uncovered a deeply flawed investigation by Victoria Police placing other Melbourne cold cases of the era under the microscope so they're looking at this as it could have been a flawed investigation so Collins, Collins Fagan was a group captain with the RAAF they were happily married with raising five children. They they got married in 1960 um, with the pair's marriage at Elwood St. Columbia's church reported in the Melbourne Society's pages. Uh, the age reported that the bride wore a cl classical gown of pure pure silk French brocard. I don't know how you pronounce that. So almost two decades later, the family of seven Friday, February 17, 1978, began like any other day. So the three eldest children, Anthony, Catherine and Rebecca, 15, 13, 12, all caught their train to their respective Catholic school. 
So the three of them were catching trains, apparently, while Marianne and the 17-month-old Patrick had taken Collins, also called Jack, to his primary school at Crawford. So one said that she, well, one article said she was doing the school run. It would seem she was, this, this account says that there was only one child and the rest were getting themselves to school. Witness accounts determined that after dropping Jack to school, Mary Ann had visited a nearby bank to withdraw her RAAF allotment, approximately $200, and at about 10.30 a.m., a policeman reported seeing a woman in a blue dress standing in the front garden of the Fagan home. Group Captain Fagan called his wife twice a day and said he had last spoken to her at 11 a.m. on the morning of February 17. In this conversation, Group Captain Fagan said that Mary Ann had complained to him about a mess that had been left in the driveway due to a burst water main. So it says Rebecca was the first to arrive home on Friday afternoon at about 4.10 p.m. She rang the doorbell after getting no response, assumed her mother was out picking Jack up from school. Soon after, Catherine arrived to find her younger sister waiting on the front porch, followed shortly by Anthony. All three children sat waiting for their mother to return home before they heard the sound of a crying baby. Knowing that their mother would never leave baby Patrick alone in the house, the three children began to feel a sense of unease. Breaking through the back door, Rebecca noticed an empty green cup and saucer sitting on the concrete near the carport, but didn't give the strange placement much thought as she ran inside to grab an unarmed but distressed Patrick from his crib. Marianne, it says Marianne was found in the bedroom by Rebecca and Jack. Now, Jack is the one that was at primary school. So what I don't, and this, is where, this is where I'm getting really confused because... Rebecca assumed that she was picking Jack up from school. Um, Patrick was in the crib. Anthony and Catherine arrived home, but I don't know. How, but it says she was found in the bedroom by. She was found in. Oh, sorry. She was found in the bedroom shared by Rebecca and Jack. Sorry, I read that wrong. So she was naked and her arms tied behind her back and ankles bound. Marianne had been gagged and stabbed a total of 14 times in the back. So I don't know how Jack got home, the, the one at primary school. So this, is the, this was the paper. Um, it says killer was in a frenzy. The killer of Mrs. Marianne Fagan might not realise he's committed the crime police said last night. Killer was in a frenzy. So th that was the newspaper headline the day after the murder. The blue dress, undergarments, stain pillow case and a Winford cigarette butt were all discovered in the bedroom. Investigations concluded that Marianne had been tied and gagged with strips of toweling that had been torn. It was determined that the toweling was from the home. Two independent witnesses at different locations had reported hearing screams between 1pm and 2pm on the afternoon of February 17. Apart from the window that had been broken by the children, there were no signs of forced entry and Patrick was unarmed in, uh, unharmed in his crib. Marianne's red imitation leather handbag, house, a car and house keys, estate savings bank passport, checkbook, credit cards, personal items, including religious medals, were never found. The money she'd withdrawn from the bank that morning was never recovered. I wonder if it was a robbery. Just days after the murder, Victorian Police then Head of Homicide Chief Inspector Noel Jubb admitted Mrs Fagan's murder bore similarities to the still unsolved, unsolved double murder in Easy Street, Collingwood, 13 months ago. So, so they're talking about... Um, that now, now they're talking about Easy Street, the Easy Street. So they were saying that there were similarities. There were indeed a number of eerie similarities between the Easy Street killings and the murder of Marianne just over a year before. Both incidences involved a sexually motivated frenzy knife attack on women while a young child was in the house. Other coincidences between the two crimes include groups of council workers who happened to be working nearby on both murder locations. Both incidences are still unsolved, which is interesting. Could it be council workers? I don't know. 
Uh, in July 1993, more than five years after the murders on Easy Street and that of Mary and Jubb, once again discussed both cases briefly to the media. Telling reporters it's likely that whoever stabbed the two women, Suzanne Armstrong and Suzanne Bartlett, to death could strike again or may have already. Easy Street will be ever present on a person's mind, Chief Inspector Jubb said at the time. If only we had an idea why anyone could be that violent towards defenseless, defenseless women, it would probably, it would perhaps be possible to solve. Interesting, uh, a reward of $1 million was announced by Victoria Police for in 2017 for information that may help solve the easy street killings. Um, then... And there was a third. There was a a year later. Um, there was a there was another woman who was stabbed multiple times in her Richmond public housing unit in 1982. She was also attacked while a young child was present. So then. September 2021, uh, Victoria Police annou announced another one million reward in relation to another Melbourne cold case from the same era. 13-year-old schoolgirl Denise McGregor was essayed and murdered in March 78, just a month after Marianne was killed. So they're trying to get um, they're trying to get these these murder. I mean, it is quite possible that these are all the same person. Um, we contacted for this story. Oh, so although it, police have deemed it appropriate to announce million dollar rewards for the cold case murders listed above, it seems Marianne's life has well and truly been conveniently forgotten um, because they're only offering a $50,000 reward. When contacted for this story, Victoria said police said the investigation into Marianne's murder was ongoing. It remains open and unsolved. Well, with any murder, the partner of the victim is always the first suspect. Group Captain Fagan had been away from the family home the night prior to his wife's murder. Group Captain Fagan had decided to stay on base for the night of February 16 after a work function and was due to return home at his usual time on Friday the 17th. In his original police statement, Group Captain Fagan said he believed his wife would ordinarily lock both the front and back door of the home during the day and would keep the windows locked unless it was a particularly hot day. The distance between his base at Tottenham and the family home seemingly eliminated Group Captain Fagan as a suspect. However, a witness cited a man in an RAAF uniform leaving the Fagan home via the front gate at approximately 12.10 on the day of the murder, drew police attention to the possibility of another Air Force man being responsible. In an article in The Age on the 3rd of March 1978, a man in RAAF uniform was described as the prime suspect in the murder. At the time, Chief Inspector Noel Jubb said the, said the witness was a more reliable person and police were 95% sure it was an RAAF uniform. Elaborating on the theory, Chief Inspector Jubb said Mary Ann may have been convert coerced into opening the front door of her home upon seeing a man in an RAAF uniform. So here's the article for that one. And there's a, a photo fit of the man that they're looking for. So apparently, uh, her, according to this, that a uh, group captain, a uh, group Captain Collins, or Fagan, was in charge of the RAAF stores depot at Tottenham. So there was lots of uniforms. There, were, there are some other uniforms similar to RAAF Airmen's issue, but the witness who gave us the most detailed description is a most reliable person. We are 95% certain it was an RAAF uniform. So he saw a man in Arda, uh, the police witness said he saw a man in an RAAF uniform come out of the front gate of the Fagan home. The uniform was rumpled, but there was no apparent blood stains. The suspect was described as about 35, 170 centimetres tall, thick set, clean shaven with a mousy coloured hair. They'd like to talk to a driver of a small green 
panel van, possibly Ford, Ford Escort, parked outside the Fagans' home for at least an hour after 11.30. So the sighting was further verified after a second witness came forward and said she had picked up a hitchhiker opposite the Fagan home on the day of the murder. This second witness said the hitchhiker had been dressed in uniform and had similar facial features to the original witness description. However, the sightings were later discredited by Victoria Police, with police stating they believed the sighting was of Group Captain Fagan, but on a different day. In an article in the Herald Sun in 2001, the retired Deputy Commissioner Paul Delanis said the false sighting had diverted attention from other suspects. Mr Delana said that all the evidence suggested that Mary Ann had, be, had been a very moral and chaste woman and there was no reason that another man would be at the fa family home. However, when one witness was asked if he believed the man he saw in uniform on the day in question looked like Mary Ann's husband, the witness told the colonial inquest in June 1979 there is a similarity to group Captain Fagan. Upon being further pressed, the witness responded, the witness then responded, but I would say no. At the time of her murder, it appeared that Mary Ann was bleaching her hair. A bowl with purple liquid was discovered in the bathroom, along with a number of Peter Stolvesson cigarette butts. The purple liquid was still in her hair when she was murdered. Given how well presented Mary Ann was, it seems unlikely that she would open the door to a male suitor in the midst of bleaching her hair. It would seem more likely that she was not expecting any company on the afternoon of February 7. Leo was only 13, so his name has been changed, obviously, when she was murdered, just streets away from his own home, said the crime had, sh had shocked the usually quite suburb of Armadale and marked the end of an age of innocence. For a week or so, I'd come running home from school to check on my mum. I was terrified I would find her dead. Leo said that his mum and the other women of the neighbourhood, including Mary Ann, would meet at the nearby shops and have a chat. It wasn't like it like it is these days, they wouldn't meet at a cafe or anything and for those women at the time, it was like a social outing of the day. Leo said that after the murder, his mother had remarked that Marianne was a very striking woman and he had always wondered if she'd been followed home by somebody with ill intent. Mum always said she was very striking, I've always wondered, so yeah, that's what Leo said. On the morning of Mary Ann Fagan's murder, council works were being conducted on Dandenong Road in front of her property. A burst water main had damaged the, front, the road in front of the Fagan home in the days prior to the murder and council workers had begun to replace the damaged sections of road. Council worker James Robert Scanlon said he arrived at the work site at about 8am. At about 9am, Mr Scanlon said he was approached by a woman driving the station wagon who asked him who was going to clean up the sludge from the driveway at the rear of her property. Mr Scanlon said he went to the back of the property with the woman and surveyed the mess from the burst water main. He said that he told the woman that it was not likely the responsibility of the council, but he would speak to the bosses to see what he could do. At approximately 1120 Scanlon said that he entered the front yard of the Fagan home with fellow council worker Ken McDonald. Scanlon said that Ken wanted to wash his hands, so they both went to the front door of the property to look for a tap. He said he did not recall whether he knocked on the door to ask for permission or not. He did not re recall seeing Ken wash his hands while they were in the front garden. In his original police statement, Scanlon said that he'd been he'd also considered asking the woman whether they could leave their tools behind her front fence while they had lunch. After lunch, the men went back to the site from 12.55 before they packed up their tools and left the site about 2.30. It must be noted that the timeline given by Scanlon puts the council workers outside the house, outside the Fagan house at Mary Ann Fagan's approximate time of death. While two independent witnesses near the Fagan residence report hearing screams between one and two, Scanlon does not report hearing any disturbance or seeing anyone enter the home. 
uh, February the 17th was the only, was the second occasion that Kenneth Alwyn Michael McDonald worked with Jim Scanlon. Age 41, at the time of the murder, McDonald lived by himself, by his own admission, had never had a sexual relationship with a woman. McDonald said on the morning of February 17, he witnessed Scanlon speaking to a woman on the corner of Bailey Avenue and Danny Long Road. McDonald reported that later that morning, Scanlon told him they'd been that he had given the woman a quote to remove the rubbish from her backyard and would return later to see if the quote was all right. McDonald confirmed he had washed his hands in the front yard of the Fagan home and Scanlon had commented that it was a classy or pricey front door. McDonald stated that later in the day he and Scanlon had been sitting on the fence and Marianne came up in conversation. I cannot remember Jim speaking sexually about Mrs. Fagan, his statement read, but the expression, when I knock them off, they stay knocked off, is like getting hit with a bucket of porridge, is familiar to me. I believe I just heard Jim use this expression, but I don't know when or where. In a later police interview, Scanlon admitted he had spoken about Marianne in a sexual way, stating he would like to bite her, you know what, and knock her off. At about 10.30 a.m., Scanlon and McDonald both left the work site. Scanlon claimed he'd gone to buy cigarettes and to his bookie's house, and McDonald said he was hungover and went to a nearby lane to vomit. When interviewed some months later, the bookkeeper denied seeing Scan Scanlon on the February 17. He said he only took had taken bets from Scanlon on a number of occasions and never paid out any bets before 5 p.m. Additionally, at the time of murder, Scanlon owed money and had been avoiding paying the bookkeeper back. So this is a sex talk on the day of death. So this was the story. Council worker James Robert Scanlon told a colleague that he would like. So there you go, that's an article. So it was sex talk. So they were talking about her. McDonald said he arrived to the site at approximately 11 a.m. and Scanlon returned at around 11.15. Upon his return, Scanlon allegedly showed McDonald a roll of notes he had apparently received from his bookkeeper. After work finished approximately 2.30 p.m., McDonald and other workers, including Scanlon, went to the Armadale Hotel. McDonald said that while the Tats Lotto area of the pub, he saw news about an incident at Bailey Avenue on the TV. When I got back to the hotel, Jim Scanlon was there with council worker Pat Quinn. The statement read, I said to Jim, what happened on Bailey Avenue today? He just laughed in a funny sort of way. I didn't tell him what I saw on TV. We just went on drinking. At about the same time, McDonald reported that two police officers came to the hotel to speak to him and Scanlon about the murder of Mary Ann Fagan. Both men were spoken to by uniformed police officers for about 10 minutes upstairs at the hotel. Despite being potential key witnesses, at the very least, Scanlon and McDonald were not interviewed by Homicide Squad detectives until nearly two months later. The interviews only occurred after Detective Sergeant David Spears was brought into the murder task force from the stolen car squad one month after Mary Ann's killing had taken place. When interviewed for the second time by Detective Sergeant Spears in 1978, Scanlon revealed he'd spoken to Mary Ann on the day of the murder. Despite initial denials when faced with McDonald's testimony, uh, Scanlon admitted he had given Mary Ann a quote about removing the rush, rubbish from her driveway. He remembered that the woman he spoke to was wearing a blue dress. He also admitted he had spoken about how attractive he found her with other council workers. David, uh, Detective Sergeant Spears queried the large amount of money that Scanlon had at the pub on the night of the murder and suggested he must have got it from the Fagan re residence. Scanlon denied it. It was also put to Scanlon by Detective Sergeant Spears that he'd been motivated to attack Marianne on the day because he was angry at women and upset that his de facto partner, Raylene and Finley, who was almost 20 years his junior, was in a lesbian relationship with a female lodger with them. Have you had a problem with finding Raylene in bed with other women? Detective Sergeant Spears asked. Again, Scanlon denied the, <laughs> the allegations. She used to be a lesbian, but that's finished. Just because the other girl who's there now is a lesbian doesn't mean Ra Raylene is. We are just helping her out, Scanlon claimed. I love women. Just because I have a bit of trouble at home doesn't mean I hate women for it. 
When questioned, though, Miss Finlay admitted to police that Scanlon would regularly lose control when consuming alcohol. Jimmy is a quiet person except when he's drunk, Miss Finlay told police after Marianne's murder. When he is, he just yells and screams. He pushed me a few times. Um, in any event, Coroner Kevin Mason found the evidence given by council workers at the inquest to be unsatisfactory, but ruled there was insufficient evidence to nominate a likely killer. Scanlon died in the early 90s when a tree he was felling hit him on the head. In, er in the 2000s, again in the early 2000s, McDonald denied any involvement in the murder of Marianne Fagan. I wonder if it was Scanlon. I mean, he's, he's dead now. So this was uh, 24, this was when it was 24 years old. And this is her, um, her, her gravestone. In 2001, Group Captain Fagan spoke publicly for the first time about his wife's murder. Speaking to the Herald Sun, Mr Fagan allowed the first photograph of his wife to be publicly shared and implored the public for any information that could lead to the arrest. I've reached the stage where I've got to look at it, this or look away, he said. Almost 25 years following his wife's murder. It's got nothing to do with closure that some people talk about it. For me, it's a tribal thing. I just want to find out who killed my wife and see that they're punished. Group Captain Fagan passed away in 2010. He never saw justice served for his late wife. Before dying, he had remarked publicly about his displeasure with the original police investigation into Marianne's murder. I was never impressed with the quality of investigation, Mr Fagan said in 2001. It seems very scattered and disconnected the whole exercise. At the conclusion of the recent inquest into the 1980 murder of Maria James, the coroner delivered an open finding but seriously crit criticised police met methods and investigatory procedures from the era, particular of evidence collection. Victoria's Deputy State Coroner Caitlin English, who heard the inquest, implored police to take immediate action to further the investigation. It may be a fresh time to look at the cold case of Marianne Fagan. So this is Sarah Davidson who, who wrote that article. So, there's still lots of questions here. <laughs> so in 1982, um, it says a nine-year-old boy whose mother was murdered three Years ago, we'll get compensation after a ruling in the High Court. The, um, so it says here that she took the youngest child, Collins, called three older, the three made their own way to school. In the ordinary course of events, Mrs. Fagan would have collected Jack after school. He was only five. But at midday, she was stabbed to death in the Melbourne home. Three older children returned home. Oh, here we go. Jack waited at school, wondering what happened to his mother. Sometime later, Jack was picked up by relatives with whom he stayed for a while. He was not te told the death until a few days later, but his, father's ev but his father's evidence was that Jack had already learnt of his mother's death through television and things he learnt at school. There we go. We've got the, we've got the answer. Because I wondered, I wondered what happened to Jack. So this is 1982. This is compensation uh, that was paid to... This is from an article. So this is called The Trove. It's a newspaper archive. And this is from uh, Wednesday the 15th of September 1982. And this was page two. This, ironically, was the Canberra Times. Um, so he was picked up by relatives. The Crimes Compensation Tribunal awarded three older children $5,000 each for pain and suffering caused by discovering their mother's naked, bound and gagged. And the baby also got 5000 
but the tribunal ruled that the pay that the psychological damage suffered by Jack was not directly connected with the criminal act as required under the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act. Oh, really? So he got nothing. He didn't get anything. In the High Court, Justices Mason, Murphy, Wilson and Brennan ruled that the Act should apply in Jack's case. He was not recovering he was not recovering as a dependent but as a victim of crime. The tribunal ought to have ruled that Jack was injured by the murder of his mother, Justice Brennan said. Justices Mason and Wilson said. The mere fact of his mother's sudden and apparently inexplicable absence, followed by the learning of her death and the effects upon him, were the direct result of the murder itself. Two judges said their judgment had been prepared by the late uh, Justice Akin and they adopted it as their own. So it was going back to the, the case was going to go back to the tribunal for, the, for an award. Now, interestingly enough, I know what a horrible way to find out. But as I said, so I couldn't work out what had happened, what had happened to Jack. But now we found out this. So this is... Um, oh. This is the high. So this is actually the high court. I don't know what. Uh, this is the high court judgment here. Fagan versus criminal uh, the crimes. So it was appealed. Um, see, it says. And then this is really sad. Um, Jack had already learnt about her death before the time of what appeared on television and for what he'd learnt from other children at school. His father said Jack was now very much a loner and withdrawn. Communication with him was difficult. The medical evidence was apparently all in writing, but documents are not before us. We're restricted to the comments made on medical evidence says there'd been a profound impact on them, all the children, and that the psychological damage will be with them for a long time. But added, it is my view that in each case, the greatest detriment has been the loss of an admirable and devoted mother. It is my understanding of the law that this greatest detriment cannot be the subject of the compensation under this act. I am prepared to act on her view that Jack suffered tremendously from the shock of not being picked up from school. So he wasn't picked up from school. He was waiting for his mother and the school was probably trying to contact the mother. And um, so it was interesting that they didn't initially give the ba baby fi uh, money, but they gave him $5,000 in the end. So here is the crimes... Um, that's the provision, that's the law provision. So just bear in mind this is from 1982. Um, the argument was advanced that the consequences as far as the children were concerned by the act requires causation and <laughs> so essentially nobody knew other than the murderer that the murder was going to take it place <laughs> like, like you can't say um they should have foreseen that their mother was going to oh. well that's right and then not to be told denied the comfort of his father yes so he was denied he was denied all of that so they allowed the appeal um and i don't know what he got but the fact of the matter was <sighs> Mental and nervous shock was an injury which was which any child of Mrs. Fagan was likely to suffer when he or she heard of the manner Mrs. Fagan's death. No doubt the trauma of seeing their mother's body more easily establishes the causational relationship between her murder and the injuries suffered by the three older children. But there is no doubt that Jack suffered an injury in the relevant sense and it was suffered as a consequence of his mother's death. The circumstances of Mrs. Fagan's age and the environment of her home at the time of her murder showed that Mrs. Fagan might have had a young family. Patrick indeed was in the cot in the adjoining room. Is manifest that her murder, not merely her death, was likely to cause mental and nervous shock to her young children. 
he could scarcely do otherwise. So, um, so just you know, it's good to see that even in 1982, uh, they were starting. They went, hang on a minute, this kid didn't get picked up from school. And it's interesting because I had my my big question was what happened to what happened to the what happened to Jack. So um, we got it. So we found out. So, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on all of that? Do you think you have an idea who could it have been? Who could it have been? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would assume that, um, I mean, I would assume that they would all know. Um, um, that the police these days would be, um, actually, I've just, uh, I've just, here, I've just got some other stuff here. Here is a clipping. Um, here is another article. This is from The Age. This is from uh, 1979. So there's, you know, lots of articles around. Oops. So this is the clip in here. Um, it says Fagan told, inquest told evidence in doubt. So this is from 21st of June 1979. Yeah, well, they haven't made that. Well, from what we can see, they've not found who the airman was. But the fact that the council worker had some winnings, I'd be interested to know if he had $200, I think, then you would say, you could nearly say circumstantial evidence. But this one says, Marianne Fagan died of a hemorrhage from stab wounds inflicted by a person unknown, the coroner, Mr K Mason, SM said. Mr Mason was concluding his inquest on Fagan, mother of five. He accepted evidence that the murder was brutal, a vicious and frenzy attack. One could theorise on possible motives. It would appear that the deceased was not essayed in any way. There is the evidence of some property and money missing from the premises. Unfortunately, there is insufficient evidence from me to decide who was the perpetrator of that particular crime. There is no doubt, of course, that Mrs Fagan was murdered, but there is a lot of doubt in respect to the evidence. Don't forget that none of her property has ever been found. Mr. Mason said the evidence of three Malvern council workers doing road near the Fagan household on the day of the murder was, to say at least, not very satisfactory. One of the witnesses, James Robert Scanlon, had been far from honest with his information he gave to police. Scanlon suggests that he had Peran told the court on Tuesday that he had a sexual conversation with another workman, Kenneth MacDonald, about Mrs Fagan the morning of the day she died. Scanlon said he had lied to police four times about what he'd done after leaving the work site at 10.30am because he wanted to protect his bookmaker who lived nearby. He said yesterday he had definitely gone to the bookmaker and collected some money but had told police that he'd not. Scanlon said he had been interviewed on one occasion for 16 to 17 hours and was told he would be charged with Mrs Fagan's murder. Group Captain Collins 
Joseph Fagan told the hearing that when allowed back in his home after three days, he'd noticed that one of his wife's handbags and two amounts of money were missing. Neither the bag nor the articles in it have been recovered, the court was told. No one has been charged with the, with the murder. So here is uh, the obituary. Uh, for uh, a group Collins Fagan. So this says, um, Group Captain uh, Fagan, Group Captain Collins, Joseph retired, deeply loved husband of Mary Ann, deceased, beloved fa father of Anthony, Kathy, Rebecca, Jack and Patrick, and love grandfather of James, Olivia, Christian, Joshua, Jemima, Joseph, Gabriel, Rose, Jackson, Ruby and Lily. Served Australia in the RAAF, Repatriation Review Tribunal and Veterans Review Board from 1950 to 2010. Peacefully on Wednesday 10th of March, closely surrounded by his five children for a long and courageous battle after a sudden illness. Our warmest thanks to the extraordinary kind staff at the Alfred who supported Dad and us throughout his time in the hospital. We are grateful to those friends and colleagues whose kindness has been such great for, such great comfort. Um, we will miss you and we'll always love you, Dad. Funeral date details later. And then there's just a tribute there. So that was um, the obituary for Group Collins Fagans. So what I also find very interesting is that he passed in 2010, but the family have just recently, I guess the house has been sitting there for a while and they're now doing something when they said they were cleaning out the attic. They were cleaning out the place in the in the Herald Sun article that I read earlier, that they've just started to get to, to clean that out and they're finding it all. So... And then here is the funeral notice. So it was, <laughs> it was a private funeral. So they just had a, f a private funeral with um, family in attendance by, by the looks of it. Um, it was on the 16th of the 3rd, 2010. Fagan, a private funeral service for Collins Joseph Fagan will be held with family in attendance. And that's it. That's all there is. So it was listed. So it was just a very private, simple funeral. There's I, there's nothing uh, that's that I found that talks about anything to do with the funeral for Marianne. There's nothing to say about any further evidence that's been found. It's uh, just one of those really really sad, I guess, crimes. It was a crime of opportunity. I guess was it was it a crime of opportunity? Was it was was it the council worker? I don't know. I mean, the council workers are pretty suspicious, and if if uh, they've said that um, that they didn't quite give the proper, you know, their answers were unsatisfactory. Well, you you would have to ask. You'd have to say, well. There's got to be something a bit suspicious there. So anyway, that is the cold case of Anne-Marie Fagan. It's, as I said, we've just hit the 45th anniversary of it not being solved. Um, as the children, you know, after all of these years, the children have finally started talked about it. Now this is, as I said, this is... Uh, Group Captain Fagan, who is now deceased, and uh, and you got to remember in the seventies was also when when this was all happening. Having been a single father, you know, it was something you know you couldn't you couldn't imagine. 
So he's actually got her wedding photo behind him. I mean, she was a beautiful lady. So she was, as I said, she was she was murdered. So yeah. So that's the question. Who was it? So, as I said, I've put the links down below. You can, but who was it? A oh, five, no less. Yes, that's right. A single dad of five. Yes, a single dad. Not only was was it unusual for single dads, being a single dad of five. So, and having to deal with the the grief and uh, navigate life. <laughs> That's all right. I my my phone, my phone just texts me as well. So yeah, I I guess that's a good sign for me to to head off now. But look, thank you for joining me on this uh, cold case. Uh, if you've enjoyed, it, I know I've I literally just read articles and and you know it's not been a who done it. But if if people have written the stories, um, as I said, I've I've put all the links below. You're more than welcome to. Go and have another read. Uh, have a closer look at this at the stories. Uh, please do. And the the Crime Stoppers details are below. If you have any information that could help give the Fagan family some justice. But thank you very much for 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 watching. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much to all the writers and uh, journalists that have covered this story. And uh, may that may we get some answers. Oh, it was very interesting. Not something I would get here in this. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Bo. As I said, it was it just appeared in my feed because as a as a forty fifth anniversary, and I started doing. I started reading it, and I went, "This is bizarre." And I just had all these questions. But as I said, we finally found out what happened to poor little Jake. And that, that's heartbreaking, the fact that little J uh, Jack, sorry, little Jack was left at school. I couldn't, I, I hadn't found anything until uh, just before I came on stream that told me what, what had happened to him, that he was left at school and picked up by relatives. So I guess it's good that he was looked after, but it's very sad that he... Um, the way that he found out, I guess. So anyway, as I said, thank you for joining. If you could hit like and subscribe. And if, as I said, if you like this, um, I will look at doing this again. I do actually have a Crime Stories playlist that I did start. So I sometimes start some stuff and then get sidetracked. But as I said, thank you very much for joining me. And I hope that you'll join me again for next time. And until then, bye for now.